or bosons are not interacting. Okay. Uh, so what we managed to obtain on Sunday, right? So the grand canonical potential was uh, minus two thirds G zero V divided by two pi squared two M h bar squared three halves an integral between zero and infinity epsilon to the three halves divide by e to the beta epsilon minus u minus one b epsilon we developed it already right so we developed how exactly we're getting here if you remember we had levels and then we assume that we have a con continuum limit, etc., etc. So this result we already obtained. Uh, another result that we obtain is basically what is the average number of particles in the system, which was, which is d psi d mu, okay. and what we found is that what we found is that the average number n was equal to g0 v divided by lambda t to the third power a polylogarithm three halves of the fugacity okay now one over lambda t lambda t is the thermal wavelength it is a square root of m k volts on t divided by 2 pi h bar squared. And this function, in general, let's call it f alpha of the fugacity equals to a sum i goes from 1 to infinity, a fugacity to the power alpha, uh, to the power i, and i to the power alpha. Uh, okay, so... And we've worked really hard to obtain this result, okay? Uh, we will discuss it in a second. Now, something that is actually quite nice to obtain, but it's obtained exactly in the same form, is that if we'll take, for example, we want to compute U, okay? It's the average energy of the system, right? So we once showed that it is d beta psi to d beta, while keeping uh, beta mu constant. Okay. Or we can just 
straightforward obtain what is the average energy by saying, well, the average energy is a sum over I, Fi, multiplied by Ei. Okay. But this is the formula. Once we perform this, right, so we have to take this uh, grand potential, uh, canonical potential, take a derivative, multiply it by beta, take a derivative with respect to beta, keeping every place that we have beta multiplied by mu constant. Okay? So if we will do it, and it's done exactly in the same fashion as we obtain this form of n, right? So we will have an integral, and then we will express this integral, this one over something as a sum, and then we'll use a Feynman trick twice. Okay, if you'll we'll do it, we will obtain that the average energy is three halves k Boltzmann t g zero v divided by lambda t to the third power. And here we will have the same poly algorithm fun. Logarithmic poly logarithm, but instead of three halves, we're going to have five halves of the fugacity. Okay. Um, moreover, we can do the same transition of calculating this integral by using the technique that we described on Sunday. So, again, what is the technique? You take one over b one this guy, okay, and you expand it and as, as a series. Taylor series, and then you uh, integrate term by term by using the Feynman uh, trick, and eventually you get to the very same polylogarithm function. Okay, so psi we can express instead of saying, well, it's just an integral, we can express it as minus k Boltzmann t v divided g0, v divided by lambda t to the third power f5 halves of the fugacity. Okay. So we explicitly obtain this relation on Sunday. And those two, these two relations over here, are easily obtained exactly in the same form. It's just a lengthy expansion of 1 over uh, e to the power of beta, epsilon minus mu minus 1. That's it. Okay, now, this result is very nice, okay, and it describes everything in, this, in terms of this f3 halves. But this f3 halves, which is a poly logarithm, has a peculiar behavior. So, look on it. So, if we have 3 halves, instead of alpha over here, 3 halves and 3 halves, this function is diverging when the fugacity is 1 or larger than 1, right? Because it's a sum, and if we put zero just 1, it will diverge. Or if you put for any fugacity that is larger than 1, it's going to diverge. And I remind you, what is a fugacity? It is e to the power beta mu. Okay. So mu cannot be 0. Now, if we plot this function, if we plot this function, <coughs> so this is f3 halves of the fugacity, and this is fugacity. It will rise to a specific point where Fugacity is exactly 1, and the value of this f3 halves is 2.612. Okay. And over here, it's a forbidden region. What's a, why it's a forbidden region? Here, fugacity is, fugacity is larger than 1. And the integral, or no, not the integral, but this function over here is divergent. Okay, so. so what happens exactly at this point? All right, so we can use this and say the following. So n equals to g zero v divided by lambda t to the third power multiplied by f 
three halves of the fugacity. Now, since the F3 half is always smaller than 2612, okay, so we can say this is smaller than uh, G0 V divided by lambda t to the third power multiplied by 2612. Okay. Now, this is a problem. Why it's a problem? Because it limits specific quantities that we can control externally, right? Because basically what it is saying that n, so the total number or the average number of particles that sits inside the system, divided by v, okay, multiplied by lambda t to the third power, divided by g0. All of this is smaller than 2.612. Now, we have two claims over here. First claim, this is a density, right? And we can control how many particles we put inside the box. So the particle size is fixed, the volume is fixed, and n is the approximately the total number of particles that we have inside the box, okay? And it's fixed value. And I can always push some more particles, right? So for a given temperature, and given G0, I can always increase N such that, remember, I'll look on the one over lambda T, it's proportional to T, or square root of T. Okay, so I can always increase this guy, right? And I will get a larger and larger N, and eventually it will cross 2.612. There is no limit of how large this can be. Or we can say, look, we have here, lambda t to the third power. So basically, this is proportional to, okay, this uh, is proportional to t to the power of minus three halves. Okay. So let's assume that I'm not putting additional particles inside the system, but I'm decreasing my temperature. Okay. So I'm getting by, this part is constant, so the average number of particles inside my system is fixed. The, the volume of my system is fixed. And then I start to lower my temperature. Okay, the smaller t becomes, the larger t to the minus three halves, become, three halves becomes. So in general, there is no limit for this expression on the left-hand side. It definitely, for small enough temperatures, can overcome this 2.612 limit. Okay. So we are here in a problem. Now, this problem originated from the fact that this function, okay, this function diverges, okay? So there is a limit to our treatment over here. But physically, we see that there is absolutely nothing that relates to this mathematical uh, limitation that we obtained, okay? Physically, there is no problem of getting this part bigger, or getting this part bigger. Right? So something essential is wrong in, in what we obtain, and, and the question is what it is. Now, the thinking of why it's a problem actually lies in this limit of what is fugacity. Remember, fugacity, we had the limitation, even before we obtained all of this, we had the limitation of fugacity, okay? Because we had the limitation that mu was smaller than zero, right? We obtained this. We calculated the average number of particles per, sub, per uh, uh, energetic level, and the average number of particles per energetic level had to be positive, or at least zero, right? And out of this came a limitation that mu has to be always smaller than zero. This means that fugacity Okay. This means that fugacity is always smaller than 1, or it can approach 1. But that it was from the fact that we said that the first level has to be 0. Around 0, yes. Around 0. The same happens over here. We, we, have only we assumed only kinetic energies right, mm -hmm. inside our system, and we assume that the lowest level is actually 0. So this, is, this limitation is okay. okay. But there is still some sort of, of something that we have done wrong. 
right? You, you, there is a dissonance between what mass is telling us, mass is telling us, but everything here is limited, and physically we can understand that we can lower the temperature and we can fix these numbers to be high enough or small enough. It's, you know, it, it's something that can be done in a lab. So what have we done wrong? That's, that's the question. We understand that something is wrong and now we have to basically find, find out what exactly we have done wrong. So let us go back a little bit and inspect our assumptions. Right? So the assumptions were we have free particles, not interacting particles, so that is fine. And we have a continuum limit, right? So this is the energy. And we assume that all the levels are continuous. Okay. This was the assumption. But in practice, is it, it is not so. Right? Because we are assuming that we have a box, right? And all the different particles are particles that are sitting inside this box over here. Right? So in practice, there is those limits are really, really nearby and that not exactly continuous, right? Because if the different particles do not interact, okay, we, we don't really care. We can calculate what are the energies inside the system, right? And we see that the energies, because we are treating a particle as a standing wave, okay? Because otherwise it will run out of this box. So it's a standing wave uh, with a free kinetic energy. <coughs> so there are some limitations and discreteness in the energetic spectrum. We assume that, well, the spectrum is continuous. So uh, let's first inspect this assumption over here. Was it correct to assume that the spectrum is continuous? Maybe all of this conundrum that, well, there is a limit, there is no limit, there is a limit, there is no limit, actually came from well, there is some discretization. And you cannot simply take a sum and say this is a sum and now I am going to use it as an integral. Okay? It is only plausible to do so if the difference, this discretization, let's call it delta, is very, very, very small. So only in the limit when delta goes to zero, only in this limit, it is plausible to do this. Now, goes to zero with respect to what? So we have a natural temperature inside our system, a natural scale of energy, K Boltzmann T. Okay. So if the differentiation between two, le two levels, two energetic levels, are much smaller than K Boltzmann T, then they are indistinguishable. Okay. Basically, we don't see this difference. This K Boltzmann T is how much energy I have to invest in order to come from one level to the next one. And if this difference is smaller than K Boltzmann T, okay, so basically there is no difference. Much, much smaller. All right, so let's see what is or how those energies are actually constructed. What is the difference? Okay. So if you look on the energies okay, of the different waves that we have can have inside the system, so the energies are N epsilon of Nx, Ny, and Nz which is P squared divided by 2N, okay. which is H squared by 2N. And here we have the standing waves, which is 1 over lambda X squared plus 1 over lambda Y squared plus 1 over lambda Z squared. Okay. Where, of course, I use that P, okay, my momentum is h multiplied by 1 over lambda x, 1 over lambda y, and 1 over lambda z. Okay. Now, what else do I know? I know that n multiplied by lambda x, or nx, multiplied by lambda x, divided by 2, equals to l. Right. So I'm assuming this standing wave representation. And n y multiplied by lambda y, divided by 2 equals L, and Nz multiplied by lambda Z divided by 2 equals to L.
Yes. Lambda, yes. It's the wavelength? Yes. <laughs> yes. Lambdas are the wavelengths. So I'm assuming my particles, particles are waves, and I'm trying to de describe everything in terms of waves. The particles are free. So this is p squared divided by 2 is always correct. What is b? b is always related to the wavelength of the particle. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, but have we already considered this with the density of states? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, the so maybe there is wrong. Maybe I was wrong. I'm, I told you that the density of states, if I have waves, right, but I can go backwards and say, well, I assume that everything here is continuous. But maybe the different n axes, different energetic levels, okay, but they are density, far away from each other. The density of states already considers this energy of standing waves. Exactly. But what, how I do I consider there the, in the density of states, what I exactly do? I consider that I have such and such amount of n's, mm -hmm. and I make a derivative of this, right? Mm -hmm. Now let's assume that uh, the energetic levels, so here I have one energetic level, and here I have another energetic level, and then I have another energetic level, so I count all the number of levels that I have, I take a derivative with n, mm -hmm. I will get a number and I, then I say, this is my density. Okay? This is mathematically fine, but if those differences here are larger than k Boltzmann t, mm -hmm. then the spectrum is not continuum, and this is a nonsense. Okay. Right? So density, we, we calculated correctly. This was fine. The problem is, can we use the density? Is our system is truly a continuum system? Maybe it's not. So it's always not continuum. There is always some differences when we are treating uh, those three particles. There are always some differences between because of the discretization that comes from the fact that we have zero boundary conditions. But the question is, are those differences larger, smaller than KBT? How they large they are compared to KBT? All right. So what we have over here. So we have epsilon and x in y and in z equals to h bar divided by 2m and mm, x divided by 2 v to the power of 1 third squared plus ny divided by 2 v to 1 third squared plus and z divided by 2v to the 1 third squared. Or in general, it equals to an x and y and z. It equals to h squared divided by 8m v to the power 2 thirds and x squared plus ny squared plus nz squared. So those are the different energetic levels that we have inside our system. Okay. And what we've done so far, we factorized over all those different levels, and we assume that well, there are actually no levels, but there, this is a continuum spectrum. Okay. And x and n y and n z vary continuously. Okay. That's what we said. Right. And. Then, instead of a summation, we have an integral with some density, which provided to us uh, by uh, Professor Debye. Okay? Great. But we do see that the energies are actually not continuous, they are discrete. Thus, on x and y and n z can be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 integer numbers. Why they are integer numbers? Because of this condition over here. Okay? Boundary conditions imposed by that we are sitting inside the box and we only uh, looking on uh, standing waves. Okay, so let us see. Let us see what is going to be the difference between epsilon two one one minus epsilon one one one. Okay. So this is this is the largest the largest. Uh, difference in energy that I can assume. So I'm looking on epsilon one 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 is my ground state, okay, and I'm looking what's the difference between the ground state and the next level. So what it's going to be? Now, if I assume the following that m is 
approximately 6.6 .6 multiplied by 10 to the minus 27. Okay, so this is helium-4. Okay, this is the mass of my boson. Uh, my volume is 10 to the minus 3 meters squared, so meter cubed. So this is uh, 1 liter. I will obtain that this is 2.5 multiplied by 10 to the minus 37 joules. Okay. Now I need to compare it to some temperature, right? So I'm saying, well, 2.5 multiplied by 10 to the minus 37 is K Boltzmann multiplied by some effective temperature. Why? Because I'm saying, well, this difference over here, I have to relate to a regular K Boltzmann T or some temperature of the system. Because if the temperature of the system is high enough such that the KB, K Boltzmann T, KBT, is larger than this difference, I don't see this. I don't see this discreteness. I'm basically falling upwards and downwards because of the thermal fluctuations. But if the temperature of the system is very, very small, I will prefer to sit in one state, and it's hard to me to jump between the different states. I will see this difference. Okay. So what is this T effective? Okay. The T effective is 10 multi 2 multiplied by 10 to the minus 14 Kelvin. Okay. So what this result tells us? This result tells us that in order to see the discreteness of the energetic spectrum, I have to cool down my system towards 10 to the minus 14 Kelvin. Otherwise, K Boltzmann T is larger than the differences in the energies, and I don't care. Right? So basically, this result tells us, for any temperature that is much larger than 10 to the minus 14 Kelvin, uh, we, there is no lab, I think, uh, uh, in our, uh, on Earth. Very, very it's extremely low. There is no lab on Earth that can actually cool down to such uh, uh, low temperatures. You see a continuum spectrum. Your spectrum is continuum in any respect that you can consider. Right? So this is good. This basically uh, argues in favor that we haven't done a big mistake by assuming that the, temp the, the, the spectrum is continuum. All right. So what else could be done wrong? What do you think? We can form an integral. Before the integral, we continue. We so so what we have done? We computed the uh, we computed the the grand canonical potential for a discrete system that have a discrete energetic state or a discrete energetic levels. All the levels were uncorrelated. So basically we proved that there was a factorization that was correct. And then the next step was, well, this, we took this discrete representation of the grand canonical potential and we replaced it by an integral. Okay. There is nothing wrong to doing so because this, those levels right, are continuous because our temperature is not 10 to the minus 14 Kelvin. Okay. It can be s small, but it's not 10 to the minus 14. What else, where else we can obtain something that is an error, something that is wrong to do? So we haven't considered the zero energy level. Okay, so what happens at the zero energy level? What happens over there? What is the average number? This is, this is a good assertion. So what happens at the zero energy level, which is when nx equals 1, 1 and 1. What happens over there? So the average number of particles, it is 1 divided by e to the power beta epsilon 1, 1, 1 minus mu minus 1. Right? This is exact and correct. Okay. All right. Now, we are working, so we know that something strange starts to happen the moment that mu approaches one, uh, zero. Okay? 
So basically when this difference between epsilon 1, 1 and minus mu is small, something peculiar starts to happen. Okay? Something peculiar starts to happen. So let's see how this n0 behaves in the limit when epsilon 1, 1, 1 minus mu is very small. Okay? So n0 in the limit that beta epsilon 1, 1, 1 minus mu is smaller, smaller than 1, okay, in this limit, what happens is that all of this, all of this is 1 plus beta epsilon 1, 1, 1 minus mu minus 1, okay? So I basically took this exponent and then expanded it in a Taylor series where I'm looking only on the first term of the Taylor series expansion, okay? And so this equals to beta, or oh, I'm sorry, k Boltzmann t, divided by epsilon 1, 1, 1 minus mu. Okay, so this is n0. Now we see that the moment that mu approaches 0, and epsilon 1, 1 is very, very close to 0, the moment that mu approaches 0, this guy goes to infinity when e mu goes to epsilon 1, 1, 1. Now, that might be a problem. Why it might be a problem? Let's assume that we pile up all our energetic levels in this direction. So this is energetic levels. And we start with zero, okay? We start with zero and we continue. Okay. Now, yes? Oh, epsilon one, one, one. No, but what is the uh, because I want to integrate. So this is uh, n of the energetic level. Okay. Now, in order to obtain the total number of n, what I've managed to do, I've managed to integrate, or I have to sum over all the epsilons of n epsilon, right? Because the average of a sum is the sum of the averages, all right? So the average number is the sum of the different average numbers, okay? So I have epsilon 1, 1, I have epsilon 1, 2, and, but this is actually a continuous, this, this we understand. This is a continuous spectrum. Now, what this result tells us, that in the limit when mu, is going towards epsilon 1, 1, 1. The value of this function, so what I have to do in my representation, there, was, there were discrete values, right? Some discrete values. And in order to perform the summation, I said, well, there are, those are not discrete values. There is a continuous spectrum, so there is a continuous function. And I have to, in order to obtain this n, I have to perform an integration. What we have done so far, this transition from a sum to an integral, is basically instead of counting those values, we said that there is a function, and we have to perform an integration over this function. This is what we have done so far. And if this function is well behaved, okay, and it somehow decays towards zero, right, this integration can be always computed. But, what is the but here? This result, what this result tells us? It can diverge. It diverges. It's like, wow, goes upwards exactly at this point. Okay, so this is a divergency. So we have some extreme situation that happens towards zero. Now, this, it's not a big problem, right? Because if I have, I also have a divergency of x minus one half, okay, and but still I can perform this integration of x to the minus one half from zero to one. x minus one half diverges around zero, but the integral is not diverging. Nothing bad happens to this integral, okay? 
Here, something bad occurred in the process, we know. So maybe it's related to this divergence. The divergence on its own is usually not a problem. It's only a problem when we, we discover that a mistake occurred. Okay. So what can be a mistake over here? The change in the start. Exactly. The the exactly. So this can be very large. This is good or bad. Well, we don't care. This, it is what it is. But in order for everything here to be compatible with the representation of an integration, there should be a sm the function has to be smooth. What I mean by smooth, I shift a little bit to the right. And what is a little bit? This difference between the energetic level, it's the minimal distance that it can be shifted to. Okay? And then this value of this function shouldn't drop too much. All right? So if this is a, something which is called also an extremely large number, and the next number is going to be much, 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 much smaller compared to this value, uh, continuous approximation cannot be treated. This point becomes an extremely important point, and it has to be dealt with cautiously, right? So I do assume, I'm, I, so, so two assumptions have been made mathematically. The first assumption is my energetic spectrum is continuous, and we found that this is okay. This axis of energetic levels can be assumed as if it continues. The second assumption is what we sound, summed over. We summed over over the average values. The change from n epsilon to n epsilon plus delta should be also small. If it's too big, if it's large, then the integral representation of the sum is not achievable. Okay? It's simply wrong to do so. Okay? So let's see if it is a correct assumption or not. So we know what happens, what is n0. Let's compute N1. So let's compute N1. Um, so what is N1? If you remember, it was, let me remind you, so n, 0 plus epsilon, okay, so the next level, the next possible level on the uh, axis of energetic levels, okay, it is uh, 1 over e to the power beta, Epsilon 2, 1, 1, minus mu, minus 1. Okay. So this is the lowest level average number of particles. This is the next level number of particles. Okay. Now, again, we are doing this approximation, which is beta epsilon 2, 1, 1, minus mu, smaller, smaller than 1. Okay, so basically, I'm taking this integral, I tailor expand it up to the first correction. Okay, so this is 1. Uh, 1 plus beta epsilon 2, 1, 1 minus mu minus 1. Okay, which is equally, exactly equals to 1 over beta, let's write it over here, k Boltzmann t, epsilon 2, 1, 1 minus mu. Okay, I don't know exactly what mu is, right? I don't know what exactly mu is, but I can write it down as k Boltzmann t, epsilon 2, 1, 1 minus, uh, minus epsilon 1, 1, 1 plus epsilon 1, 1, 1 minus mu. Okay. Um, 
this guy we can't compute it already, right? So this equals to our temperature divided. Let's work in this regime of what? Of epsilon 2, 1, 1 minus epsilon 1, 1 divided by k Boltzmann. We know what this guy is, right? It is 10 to the minus 14, okay? So this value is 10 to the minus 14 plus epsilon 1, 1, 1 minus mu divided by k Boltzmann, okay? So we basically have to calculate what this guy is. Epsilon 1, 1 minus mu divided by k Boltzmann. So if we do it, if we do it as we do already have done it, this guy is 10 to the minus 21. Okay. So we have two terms here. The difference between the energetic levels, okay, which is 10 to the minus 14, you can say, wow, that's an extremely low number. Okay. But this number is much, 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 much smaller. Okay. So basically what we obtain is the following. N0, okay, as N0 is the temperature divided by 10 to the minus 21. N0 plus epsilon is on the order of temperature 10 to the minus 14. Okay. So N0 divided by N0 plus epsilon is all the order of 10 to the 7. That means? No, my plus. There is much more particles at N0 than at N0 plus epsilon. Uh, no, it's fine. The minus cancels out and then you move the from the denominator to the numerator. So this, this difference. Is 10 to the 7. Seven orders of magnitudes drop in the value of the function. Okay? Now it's the smallest delta that we can assume. It's the smallest distance that we can move to the right, and the function immediately drops down by seven orders of magnitude. Okay? The approximation or the integral approximation is simply impossible. That's what it means. That's exactly what it means. That when we produced all of this, when we produced all of this, okay, when we produced all of this, we basically computed this integral over here. And this integral, okay, so this integral was what? This was G zero V, right? This, uh, this, what we obtained, uh, yeah, blah, 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 blah. I don't remember it. Okay, so here it is. So this is G zero V divided lambda T to the third F three halves of the fugacity. This is the integral. But what actually happens is that exactly at zero, at the lowest energy, there sits something that we can call a delta function, right? There is a specific delta function that sits over here. This is the best approximation that they can imagine, okay? The spectrum here is continuous, but there is one special point, which is the lowest level, okay, which is the lowest level where at some kind of delta function that is sitting. So I cannot simply integrate everything and say, well, it's a continuum. I have to treat this function explicitly, okay? I have to look on this function and say, something weird going on here, okay? And it looks like a delta function, so into the total amount of the particles that are sitting here and described by this integral representation, I also have to add the particles that are sitting at the lowest level. Okay? So at the lowest level, there are particles that are sitting. So, so what physically happens? And I'll write down the math in a second. As I lower my temperature, At some point, so let's assume that what we know. We know that n equals to g0v divided by lambda t to the 3 
F3 halves of the Fugazi. Uh, yeah. okay. So I lower my temperature and at some point I'm reaching temperature such that n divided by v uh, lambda t to the third divided by g0 equals exactly f3 halves of 1 which is 2.61. And I can call it a critical temperature, like a critical temperature that we had for phase transitions once before. So I lower the temperature, I lower the temperature. This n described very well okay, by this function over here, and everything is fine. At some point, I reach this critical situation okay, that is satisfied by this equation over here. So there is a specific critical temperature. The average number of particles is fixed. The volume is fixed. The the uh, degeneracy is fixed. The only thing that I change is temperature, and I lower my temperature. The lower my temperature, and I lower my temperature. At some point, this becomes large enough <coughs> such that all of this equals to two point sixty one. And then something something extreme starts to happen. So it's exactly like a phase phase transition that we've seen before. What starts to happen? We know that as we approach this limit. On the Epsilon goes to 1, it means mu goes to towards 0. So the chemical potential starts to approach the lowest energetic level. Okay, so if you plot the levels over here, here is 0 or epsilon 1, 1. Okay, and mu is somewhere over here. This is mu. Okay, remember, the chemical potential is a function of temperature and it grows, we've seen it before, it grows as a function of temperature or lowers as a function of temperature. So for the fermions, it's going towards zero. The same happens over here. Okay. So we, de decrease the uh, we decrease the temperature, and this mu is approaching to epsilon 1, 1. It's approaching and approaching and approaching. Now, now what starts to happen? We know that what starts to happen is that N0, the average number of particles, it is approximately K Boltzmann T, divided by epsilon 1, 1, 1 minus mu. Or let's write it down exactly. N0 equals exactly to 1 over e to the power beta mu minus 1. And I assume here that my lowest energy, this epsilon 1, 1, is so small that it's approximately 0. Right? So what happens when mu approaches zero. The exponent is approaches one, so this guy starts to explode. It starts to diverge. There's a lot of particles that starts to accumulate exactly at this lower level. This is why we have something that we call the delta function. Okay? But, there is a but. What's the but? We know that n zero is always smaller to the total number of particles that we have inside the system. Okay. It cannot they really, really, really diverge. Why? Because we have a limit on the number of particles that can sit inside this box. Right? Because we put a specific number of particles inside the box, and the total number of particles that sits on the lowest level cannot overcome this total number of particles. It's impossible. So what happens? We lower the temperature. There start accumulation of particles on the lowest level. But nothing really bad happens on the next levels. Right? So this is why we can say here is some sort of a delta function that describes the accumulation of the particles on the lowest level. But the next level is protected by this zero energy level. Why? The particles accumulate only there and nothing bad happens in this whole region. Okay? So if I want to describe to you schematically The situation, it goes like this. For T larger larger than Tc, okay, this critical temperature that something starts to happen when something critical in my equation appears, all the different particles, so this is epsilon, all the different particles are sitting everywhere. Okay, they're 
some particles sitting at the lowest level, some particles sitting on the higher levels. All the particles are distributed according to somehow. Right? There is this grand canonical potential, and it provides me the representation of where the particles are sitting. When I'm getting to Tc to T smaller than Tc, the majority of those particles are piling up on this lowest energetic level. Everyone goes there? So not exactly everyone, but majority or macroscopical portion of the total number of particles. Remember, we don't have three particles or seven. We have 10 to the 22. So huge portion of those particles, majority in some sense, is actually going to sit at the lowest level. There are some particles up here. But the majority is sitting in this guy, right? So this is the difference. If I'm as asking you, well, how many particles are sitting in a specific level? You have to say to me about zero because we have to talk about densities. At a specific level, there is only microscopical number of particles sitting, okay? But the situation in the, for the lowest level, it's not true when we go below this critical temperature. So what happens below the critical temperature, huge number of particles piling up, okay? The next levels don't care already because this level is protecting them from accumulation. And this is called a condensation transition. Condensation transition. It actually has a specific name, Bose condensation transition. So eventually what the physics is, why what happens is that unlike fermions that remember what happens to fermions they pile up on top of each other because there is a Pauli exclusion exclusion principle they have to pile up bosons act completely in the other way they do not pile up on top of each other they just lie down in one single uh, row and they prefer to be exactly at the lowest energetic state and this is what creates all the interesting phenomena how exactly we define this TC and how we treat the situation below the critical transition, we'll do it tomorrow. Sorry for taking your time. נכון? אז אתה לא יכול למלא את זה עד אינסוף. באיזשהו שלב כל החלקיקים שהכנסת לתוך המערכת יהיו שם, ובזה זה ייגמר. נכון? יש לך, ה-N הזה זה מה שהכנסת לתוך המערכת. ה-N הזה. זה מה שהכנסת. וזה לא יכול להתבדר. הכנסת 10 אז יש שם 10. הכנסת 10 בסקאפ 22 זה מה שיש. כן, אין יום. הליום ארבע, הליום ארבע, יש לו גם ארבע אלקטרונים, אתה צריך מספר זוגי של אלקטרונים, ופרוטונים של אלקטרונים, כן, אתה רק צריך מספר זוגי של אלקטרונים, אתה צריך משהו שהסקיע כולל, כן, כל 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 אתה צריך כי הסקינה היום מתחבר, נכון? בגלל שבכל אלקטרון יש ספין פלסטי, אז נניח יש לך משהו עם ספינים פלסטי. לא, זה יהיה קלפי כשהספינה כולל שלו הוא שלם, וזהו. הוא לא גוזון? כי כל פעם יש לי ספין שלם, הוא גוזון. אבל רואים את זה, את התופעה הזאת רואים. בטח, אז יש, ברגע שהם יושבים כולם, נוצר לך מצב פרנטי כזה מגניב, אז יש חומר שהוא נקרא סופר פלואידיטי, כלומר זה חומרים שיכולים לזרום בלי התנגדות, או סופר קונדקטיביטי, זרימה של חשמל בתוך חומרים, שאין שום התנגדות בכלל. שהם לא מתחמם, כאילו הם לא... לא, אם אתה תחמם אותם זה ייהרס, יש לך טיסי. אבל אם זה קר מספיק, אז יש לך הולכה של חשמל. בלי שיש לך התנגדות בכלל. כי בעצם, מוליכה, בגלל שיש לך גאפ כזה שנוצר והם לא רוצים לעבור למעלה. הם כולם יושבים ברמת התמונה. יש לך רכבות כאלה, מגלה. אה, כן. נכון? כתבו את זה כן. איפה שהוא רכבות שזה... כן, לא יודע, טוב, אבל... 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 כן, לא יודע, טוב, אבל...